Yeah, we've been in a depression since 2007. Now, let me define a depression, and I'll use uh, John Maynard Keynes' definition. Uh, people, you know, the technical definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP with, you know, a couple other indicators, rising unemployment, et cetera. That's how economists define a recession. Uh, depression is not nearly as um, uh, numerically defined, so a lot of people assume, well, gee, if a recession is two quarters of declining GDP, then a, a depression must be worse than that. It must be 10 quarters of declining GDP, et cetera. But that's not the definition. The definition of, de- of a depression is you have depressed growth relative to trend. Uh, this is what John Maynard Keynes uh, said, uh, you know, a, a sustained period of below trend growth with no tendency either towards collapse uh, in the short run or uh, return to trend. So long-term trends in U.S. growth, and um, we talk about world growth, but let's just talk about the U.S. for a second, kind of three, three and a half percent, certainly post-World War II, uh, the U.S. has produced that kind of growth um, on a sustained basis with occasional technical recessions. But we've had eight years of growth around 2%, and more recently it's been below 2%. So that gap between the 2% that we're actually getting and the 3 3.5% that we're capable of is depressed growth. It's an output gap, and it represents lost wealth, and it's getting bigger over time. So you take two lines and put them on different trajectories and extend them over time, the gap between them gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's the output gap. And, you know, you say, gee, 2%, 3%, it's only 1% difference. What's the difference? The difference is enormous when you compound it over time. The the 3% society or 3.5% society will be twice as rich as the 2% society over, say, a 35 40 year period, you know, by the time our, we have young children, by the time they're grown, or by the time we're, um, you know, older, um, the, the one society will be twice as rich as the other. So it's a very big deal. That's what we're in. The best way to understand the United States is we're in a depression. We look like Japan. Uh, you know, back in the early 2000s, people talked about the lost decade. You know, the 90s were a lost decade in Japan. Well, guess what? They're now into their third lost decade. It was the 90s, the early 2000s, and now into the uh, the second decade of the 21st century. And the U.S. is catching up. We, we've been in a depression for eight years, uh, sorry, uh, going on nine years at this point. We'll be in this depression as far as the eye can see unless we make structural changes. And the problem all along is that the, the, the problems in the economy are structural We've been trying to use monetary solutions, you know, quantitative easing, low interest rates, zero interest rates, forward guidance, helicopter money, this whole grab bag of monetary policy tricks. But you cannot fix a structural problem with a monetary solution. You need a structural solution. That involves politics, but our politics are completely dysfunctional. We're not getting it. So I would expect this would continue. This is a crisis. Now, it's a quiet crisis. It's a slow motion crisis. Uh, but we're, but in addition to that, so that's, just, that's the state of the economy. But in addition to that, we have a, 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 an incredibly unstable financial system. You have to distinguish between capital markets and the financial system and occasional financial panics on the one hand and economic depression on the other. Those, sometimes they go together. In 2008, they went together. We had a technical recession and a financial panic. But you can have financial panics without recessions. We had that in October 19th, 1987. Um, you know, just celebrated the 19th anniversary of that. The stock market fell 22% in one day. Um, in today's, uh, in terms of uh, Dow points, Dow Jones Industrial Average points today, that would be the equivalent of a 4,000 point drop in the Dow. Uh, you know that if we had a 400 point drop, that would be front page news, uh, you know, headline news all over the world. But imagine a 4,000 point drop. That's what happened in 1987. So that was a panic, but it was not a recession. The economy actually was doing fairly well that year. Likewise, uh, Japan throughout the 90s was in a depression, still is, but there were no particular financial panics after after 1990. So uh, sometimes they go together, sometimes they don't. Right now, we have the worst of all possible worlds. We have an economic depression but we're heading towards a financial panic. Uh, and when that comes, there are going to be some fairly horrendous consequences. And that's what I discuss uh, in my book, The Road to Ruin. 
So when you say a financial panic, uh, what do you mean? Do you mean we're going to see something like 2008? Oh, much worse. Uh, the answer is yes, but it'll be a lot worse than that. And uh, I base that on um, the science. This is all explained in the book. Uh, you know, I don't like to make claims without backing it up with analysis, which could come from various sources. It could be history. It could be applied mathematics. It could be, um, you know, physics. It could be uh, economics. There are a lot of branches of science, that behavioral psychology, et cetera, that you can use. But, you know, the, uh, the evidence for that is is clear. Uh, and the way I explained it in the book, um, I have a tempo of three panics 10 years apart. Uh, the first one I talk about is 1998. Uh, the second one is 2008. And the third one is 2018. Now, obviously, that's a kind of forecast. And just to be clear, it could happen tomorrow. I'm not putting a stake in the ground saying, you know, 2018, like clockwork, we're going to have a financial meltdown. It, it's it's my estimate but it could have, you know, it could be a year later. It could be tomorrow. Uh, the, the point is, investors need to prepare for it right now. So in 1998, of course, you had the famous meltdown of long-term capital management. That was the hedge fund. You had a Russian default. Uh, you had um, a Wall Street bailout. Uh, by the way, I negotiated that bailout. I was the chief lawyer for long-term capital management, so I was in the room with uh, Treasury officials and Federal Reserve officials and private bankers and others. A lot of lawyers running around when we did the bailout. We came uh, hours away from shutting every stock and bond market in the world. That's how bad that panic was. Now, that that outcome didn't materialize because we got the bailout done, but we came extremely close. In 2008, uh, we were days away uh, from the sequential collapse of every major bank in the world. So uh, in you know March 2008, Bear Stearns failed. June, July 2008, Fannie and Freddie failed. Uh, September 2008, Lehman failed. We were watching the sequential collapse of every bank. After Lehman, we were just days away from Morgan Stanley's collapse, then Goldman Sachs, then Citibank, then B of A, and then ultimately J.P. Morgan. They all would have failed. Uh, but the government truncated the process. One of the points I make in the book is that the dynamic process of financial collapse is exactly like other dynamic processes uh, of complex systems, um, whether it's earthquakes, volcanoes, forest fires. And it's not just a metaphor. The science and the dynamics are the same. The difference is that, uh, just use seismology and earthquakes, for example, that's a natural system. Capital markets are a man-made system. They both respond to the same dynamics. The difference is that you cannot stop an earthquake. Once an earthquake starts, you cannot truncate it. But that in a financial panic, you can truncate it, but there's a cost associated with that. You can intervene to stop the dominoes from falling just by you know, dropping a steel wall between two dominoes. But there's a cost. Imagine hypothetically uh, that an earthquake starts. Imagine you could stop it. You can't, but imagine if you could. All that would happen is that all that stored up energy would still be there waiting for the next time. In other words, an earthquake is just the release of energy. If you could hypothetically truncate it, the energy wouldn't go away. It wouldn't dissipate. It would be waiting for the next earthquake, which would be even bigger than the one before. That's exactly what's happening in financial space. When you truncate these collapses, you just store up that energy for the next time. So uh, in 2008, Wall Street bailed out a hedge fund. In I'm sorry, in 1998, Wall Street bailed out a hedge fund. In 2008, the central banks bailed out Wall Street. In the next crisis, let's say 2018, if not sooner, who's going to bail out the central banks? Each bailout, each crisis gets bigger than the one before, and the solution gets bigger. And the next time, the solution is going to be different than the last two. They're going to have to go to the IMF, and the International Monetary Fund. They have the only clean balance sheet left in the world. They have world money called the Special Drawing Right, SDR for short. Um, and that's where the liquidity is going to come from, and that's going to be the end of the dollar as the benchmark global reserve currency. Now, we'll still have dollars. I mean, I'm not saying dollars are going to go away, but it'll be a local currency like Mexican pesos or Turkish lira. It won't. It will not be the benchmark global reserve currency. That'll be the SDR. Uh, that's one difference. The other difference is in 1998 and 2008, when people wanted their money back, and that's what a financial panic is, everybody wants their money back, Central banks, in effect, printed the money and gave it to you. Gave it to you. They gave you your money back. 
Uh, in the next panic, you're not going to get your money back. They're going to lock down the system. They're going to suspend redemptions of money market funds, close banks, close exchanges, reprogram ATMs so you can get maybe $300 a day, let's say, for gas and groceries, but no more than that. When all this happens, they'll say it's temporary until we can come up with a solution. They'll convene an international monetary conference. Uh, the uh, IMF will announce that they're reliquifying the world with special drawing rights. But that will all take time. That'll take, you know, three or six months. Last time it took about uh, 11 months uh, to get the, the SDRs issued, which they did in August 2009. Um, so in that three or six month period, they're going to have to lock down the system. And um, that's why I recommend having tangible forms of wealth outside the digital money system. So when this happens, what happens to the link um, with the dollar? Because you're saying the dollar is going to be a local dollar, but then we also have the petrodollar. Um, what happens to that whole system? Well, the petrodollar goes away. I mean, what ha- the, the petrodollar is nothing more than the major oil producers, particularly Saudi Arabia, agreeing to price oil in dollars. Um, this is something that was worked out in 1974, uh, Jerry Parsky, Bill Simon, Henry Kissinger, Helmut Sonnenfeld, others I met with Helmut Sonnenfeld at the time, we uh, we talked about the possibility of invading Saudi Arabia and securing the oil fields and, you know, pumping the oil and at a price that we liked. Uh, that's not what was done. What, what, what was done is we got the Saudis to agree to price oil in dollars. There's no particular reason why oil has to be priced in dollars. It, at the time, it could have been priced in German Deutschmarks, it was before the euro, of course, or you could have priced it in gold, et cetera, but they agreed to price it in dollars. They also agreed to take the dollars from the oil sales and redeposit them either in U.S. government securities or in U.S. banks, particularly Citibank, where I worked at the time in the, in the late 70s. And then the banks, <coughs> pardon me, would lend the money to, say, South America or Africa, who would buy U.S. equipment, and we got the whole game going again, got the circulation flowing again. That was the petrodollar deal, and it's prevailed ever since. But that's pretty much history uh, at this point. Uh, the Saudis are the Saudis' big, biggest customer. Saudi Arabia's biggest oil customer is China. Uh, China is uh, emerging. The, the Chinese yuan is not going to be a global reserve currency anytime soon. It's not even close to that. But the IMF, as of October 1st, included the Chinese yuan in the SDR basket in the, the one of the five reference currencies. There used to be four. Uh, used to be dollars, euros, yen, and uh, pound sterling. Now they've added a fifth. Uh, it's kind of like joining a very exclusive club that only had four members. Now it has five members. So China's part of the SDR. And the reason that was done is, um, again, I talk about this in the book, the, the elites see all this coming. I mean, we're explaining it for uh, for the listeners today, but this is stuff that the elites understand perfectly. They're signaling each other. They're not signaling everyday uh, citizens, but they are signaling each other. And the way they're doing it is the way I'm describing. Why did the IMF include the yuan in the SDR reference group if it's not really a global reserve currency? Well, the answer is they bent the rules for political reasons, because when it comes time to issue trillions of SDRs to reliquify the system, they're going to need China's vote. I mean, China's the second largest economy in the world. They have about 10% of the voting power at the IMF. Uh, you couldn't do something that momentous without having China's agreement. Why should China agree if they're not even part of the SDR? So the deal was include them in the SDR, and then implicitly you have China's consent when it comes time to print SDRs. Um, which is what they're going to do. So so that'll be the end of the petrodollar. From then on, you'll price oil in SDRs. Um, you'll uh, probably major corporations will uh, produce their financial statements in SDRs. And by the way, uh, July 15, 2016, the IMF released a technical paper calling for the rise of what they call the MSDR as opposed to the OSDR. Now, what's that? SDR, as we mentioned, stands for Special Drawing Rights. That's the world money printed by the IMF. The OSDR is the official SDR that the IMF itself prints and hands out. The MSDR is uh, market SDR. M stands for market. The IMF is trying to encourage the creation of a private market in SDRs. And no sooner did they release that paper than the World Bank issued a 200 billion SDR bond issue. Notice I didn't say 
200 billion dollars or 200 billion euros it was 200 billion SDRs that bond issue was underwritten mostly by Chinese banks it was purchased mostly by Chinese investors but if you're a large institutional investor you know your PIMCO or Harvard Endowment you can call up your broker uh, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and buy some of them so already we're seeing private transactions and SDRs this is none of this is secret it's all out there but it's so technical that People tend either not to pay attention to it or if they hear about it, they don't really understand it. And what I try to do in my book is explain all this in, in plain English. Um, I never dumb things down. The, the book is written at a very high level. But I do use plain English uh, metaphors, examples, and stories so that it's very accessible and try, so that people can, uh, can follow along uh, and understand what's actually happening with their money. But, yeah, the petrodollar deal is over. Uh, in the future, oil, in the not-too-distant future, oil will be priced in SDRs. Now, I'm just trying to get this straight in my head, and I'm sure everyone else who's listening trying to get this straight in their head. So once the dollar is no longer uh, a reserve currency, is that what you're saying? No longer will the dollar be a reserve currency? No, it, it'll still be around. It'll still be a reserve currency. It won't be the benchmark leading reserve currency. That will be the SDR. So that'll diminish the role of the dollar. And then what we'll start to see is, um, you know, as I say, transact, they'll, they'll flood the market with SDRs and that will be highly inflationary. So your dollar will be worth less and less. So the way to understand the dollar in that world, it'll be like Mexican pesos or Turkish lira. So if I go to Turkey today, uh, I'm going to get some Turkish lira. If I go to Mexico, I'm going to get some Mexican pesos. So a tourist coming to the United States will get some dollars. You and I will still have dollars for walking around money, but it will it will be not worth nearly as much because of inflation, and it will no longer be the reference currency, the important things in the world, settlement of balance of payments between countries, the price of oil, the financial statements of major um uh, corporations like Volkswagen, uh, IBM, General Electric, that will all be in SDRs, and then that will be uh, a, a part of the process of ultimately diminishing the role of the dollar. So the dollar doesn't go away. It just loses importance. We lose our uh, – we, the United States, lose our privileged position to um, spend money in currency that we print. I actually had this discussion at the Pentagon. I was meeting with their chief futurist. The, the, the Pentagon is a futurist, a person who – thinks about um, the future warfare, the future technology. Uh, and I said, uh, I said to him, uh, I said, you know, the day will come when a U.S. destroyer will pull up at a fuel depot in Singapore and you'll say, fill her up, and they'll say, fine, pay me in SDRs. And for the first time, you'll have a very expensive forward-deployed military that you have to pay for in a currency that you don't print. And that really made an impact. He said, ah, oh, you're right, so... Where are we going to get our SDRs? Because the U.S. can always print dollars, but we can't print SDRs. We have to get them from the IMF. That means, you know, the BRICS have a role, China, Russia, all these other uh, powers have a role. Of course, the U.S. is is still, uh, you know, the biggest economy in the world. We have the biggest vote at the IMF. I'm not saying the, the U.S. is going away or the dollar is going away. What I'm saying is this is part of a process by which the dollar is eclipsed exactly the way sterling was eclipsed between 1914 and 1944. Um, but if you uh, are a long-term investor or you're concerned about your wealth or preserving wealth, uh, the sooner you understand this and the sooner you can begin to take measures to preserve your wealth that don't rely on digital dollars, the better off you'll be. So what you're saying, those people that have uh, currency in the bank, uh, pensions, uh all that is going to be devalued? Exactly. Um, if you have any kind of fixed dollar claim, so a bank deposit, a pension, an insurance policy, an annuity, um, you know, when the inflation comes, you'll still get your dollars, uh, not not necessarily in every case, but by and large, you'll get your dollars. They just won't be worth very much. You know, Between 1977 and 1981, five-year period, the United States had 50% inflation, just actually slightly more than 50%, not 15, 50. The value of the dollar was cut in half. You know, a lot of people look back to the creation of the Federal Reserve uh, in 1913 and say, you know, since then the purchasing power of the dollar has lost 95%, which is technically true, but you know, 1913 was 103 years ago. But here you had a five-year period where it lost more than half its purchasing power. That's coming again. It'll happen when... 
the financial panic hits, when the world has to reliquify with SDRs, and you know, you print five, six, seven trillion SDRs and hand them out to governments, which is what they do. Uh, you know, people don't get SDRs. You and I are not going to have SDRs as walking around money. These are given to governments, but the governments will spend it. They're very good at that. By the way, under the IMF Articles of Agreement, they, they are not limited to giving the SDRs to countries. They can also give them to multilateral institutions. So you could give SDRs to the United Nations, and they will. You could give them to the World Bank, and they will. And those will be used for globalist uh, uh, purposes, such as you know climate change, infrastructure spending. I don't want to debate climate change. That's a separate topic. But my point is, this money will get printed. It will get handed out. It will get spent. It will be inflationary. The value of the dollar will be diminished. You can see this coming a mile away. So why not you know get ready for it with some tangible assets, whether it's gold, silver, land, fine art, natural resources. There are a lot of things you can do. And I'm not even saying 100%, just have some portion of your portfolio allocated that way. And I, I talk about all this in the book. This sounds like a, a global currency um, for the globalists. And the people on the street, uh, most of the people are not aware of this. They don't understand what's going on. And when this happens, aren't people going to be upset? Well, uh, yes, but the question is, will they understand what happened? Of course, that, that is why I wrote the book. That's why I wrote The Road to Ruin, so that we can lay out a, a roadmap and put it in plain English and people can understand it and see it coming. And I hope people uh, you know, do buy the book and read it and, and are prepared for this. But at, at the time, look, people barely understand the Federal Reserve. You know, everyday American, you say Federal Reserve, they think it's a kind of uh, aged whiskey, you know, some old reserve whiskey. They don't understand. And by the way, a lot of this is by design. Why is the Federal Reserve not called the Central Bank of the United States? It is the Central Bank of the United States. Why don't they call it that? The reason is that the United States had two central banks before. Americans hate central banks. We got rid of both of them. We had a central bank that we got rid of in uh, 1812. Uh, we had another central bank that we got rid of in uh, 1835. Um, so Americans hated central banks. So when it came time uh, for the Rockefeller and Morgan interest to create a new central bank in uh, around 1912, 1913, they gave it a funny name so that people wouldn't know what they were doing. Uh, they called it the Federal Reserve System. Same thing with the SDR. It's world money. You know, the Federal Reserve has a printing press. They can print dollars. The European Central Bank has a printing press. They can print euros. Well, the IMF has a printing press. They can print special drawing rights or SDRs, which is just world money. So why don't they call it world money? Well, that's too scary. You know, if, if I actually call it world money, people go, oh, gee, that sounds a little spooky, a little like world government, world taxation, which are also coming, by the way. And I talk about that in the book. So they give it these funny technical names so people don't understand it. So when the inflation comes, I mean, maybe people will be writing to their congressmen or you know, picketing outside the Federal Reserve, but they'll just point fingers, you know, who knows where the IMF is? You know, it's over in, uh, you know, G Street in, uh, in a certain neighborhood of Washington, a few blocks from the Fed, but they'll, they'll say, hey, it's not us, it's those guys over there at the IMF. No, people don't understand what the IMF is. They don't understand it's the central bank of the world. They don't understand how SDRs work, although, as I say, I do explain it in the book, but um, the point is the, they won't know where the inflation is coming from. Now, the question is, Will it work? Um, it might, uh, partly because what we're, what we're just discussing, which people don't really understand it, but it might not. And that goes to your point. You might see money riots, and, and I talk about this in the book. You might see social unrest, uh, people starting to burn down banks, etc. But the elites are ready for that also. Um, you know, the, under the uh, uh, Posse Comitatus Act, it is illegal for local authorities to use the military for police, uh, police activities. Um, but there's what they've done is, okay, if we can't use the military for police, we'll take the police and make turn them into the military. Uh, and you see that, you know, look at your local police force. I mean, when I was a kid, uh, a cop was part of the neighborhood community who would occasionally get a kitten out of a tree. Today, they're, you know, juiced up on steroids. They're armored up. They've got Kevlar vests. Uh, helmets, night vision goggles, automatic weapons, flashbang grenades, battering rams, armored personnel carriers, they're good to go, meaning they look like the SEAL Team 6. Um, and so this is, I have a chapter in the book devoted to uh, uh, the rise of neo-fascism. So you're right, maybe this will work and your money will be stolen by inflation, but if you feel like going out and protesting it, be prepared for 
uh, militarized pushback. So, you know, societies don't go, go don't go down with, without a fight, and the worse things get, the more the response function will be. So, this is also, uh, as I say, described in, in a lot of detail in the book. But importantly, I don't make claims like this without providing the backup. So, as I say, it's there are 151 uh, end notes uh, with numerous resources. Uh, as I say, scientific and uh, mathematical and historical and academic, uh, uh, personal interviews, et cetera, that to, to back all this up. When this happens, you mentioned lockdowns where the banks will be locked down. How, how long do you think the banks will stay closed? Well, uh, the, we, do, we won't know when they do it. And by the way, all of this has happened before. You know, I, I talk about things like this and they go, well, that would never happen. I say, well, I don't know what history books you've been reading, but in 1933, President Roosevelt, by executive order, closed every bank in America, just said, you're closed. He did not say when they would reopen. Now, it turns out that they opened about, they reopened about eight days later, but at the time he closed the banks, he didn't say when they were going to reopen. People say, oh, they'll never shut the stock exchange. Well, from uh, July to November, sorry, December to, uh, 1914, the New York Stock Exchange was closed for five months. Uh, it was also closed during Hurricane Sandy, closed during 9-11, closes every weekend for that matter. The point is, uh, these things do happen all the time. Look at Cyprus, look at Greece. There, you know, people in Greece, uh, in 2015, they were, they were flying to Munich and with empty luggage and coming back with suitcases full of euros because the banks were closed, the ATMs were turned off, the credit cards didn't work. Uh, there was no money. They were, they were reduced to barter and they were going to, Germany, as I was saying, coming back to Athens with, with euros so they could have some money. Uh, so all these things have happened before in the United States. They're happening recently elsewhere around the world. Uh, this is all in, in the, the elite blueprint. Uh, just look at the uh, G20 Brisbane Summit, November uh, 2014, Brisbane, Australia. There was a final communique. Uh, there were various working papers backing up the final communique. And in those working papers, which I've read and which I talk about in the book, The Road to Ruin, um, is the, the blueprint for the bail-in plan. Now, remember, in 2008, everything was bailed out. Uh, but bailouts were politically unpopular. A lot of the backlash you're saying, you know, Pirate Party getting winning some seats in Iceland, uh, uh, the rise of Donald Trump, um, you know, the the uh, uh, the Brexit vote, uh, the Italian referendum that's coming up. You see a lot of signs of this kind of popular unrest or popular resistance to elites. So the elites get it. They know they can't bail out the system again with uh, taxpayer money. So what they're going to do is bail in the participants. So who are they? Well, depositors are going to find their accounts frozen. Maybe haircuts. Stockholders are going to get wiped out. Bondholders are going to take haircuts. Um you know, other measures, the worse it gets, the more the lockdown will, will spread. So when on the day they do it, we won't know exactly how long it's going to be, but it'll be long enough to implement some of the solutions I've talked about, including this massive issuance of SDRs. But that, that's not overnight. I mean, that'll take at least a few months, maybe longer. Um, and uh, so it, it could be a long time. For those people who have been accumulating gold and silver, uh, what can they expect? Uh, will gold rise? Will it fall? Well, gold will go up a lot. I mean, I expect it to go to $10,000 an ounce. But, you know, remember, they will say, be careful what you wish for. When gold goes to $10,000 an ounce, you know, people go, oh, gee, I, you know, I bought it for 1300 Yeah, yippee, I made all this money. Well, you didn't really. What you did is you preserve wealth because what gold is a constant. When gold goes to $10,000 an ounce, I don't think of gold as going up. I think of the dollar as going down. In other words, that's an 80% devaluation of the dollar, meaning massive inflation of the kind we described. What the gold does do, it preserves your wealth. Everyone else is getting wiped out, and you're still standing because you preserved wealth by having hard assets. Gold is one of them, and there are others. I mentioned some of them, as I say, fine art land, income-producing land, uh, silver, um, natural resources, water, you know, et cetera. But what you've done is, yeah, you've made money nominally, and maybe that feels good. But the way I think about it, uh, everyone else is wiped out, and you, you're not wiped out. You've preserved your wealth.